Hello, hello, welcome back. My name is Fan Lin, and I work at uh, Leiden University. Um, I work on uh, Chinese art. So uh, this is a uh, panel two. The second panel focused on exhibitions, and I guess Rex Museum is the perfect place to talk about uh, exhibitions. So museum and uh, collecting has gained uh, momentum in research and also public attention during the past, but past 20 years. Uh, so uh, today uh, we will uh, have uh, four presenters uh, focusing on different aspects uh, on, uh, in exhibitions and also collecting. Uh, so uh, they are from uh, different parts of uh, the Netherlands, uh, from Utrecht, uh, from Amsterdam, uh, and also um, uh, yeah, uh, Rotterdam, uh, so uh, and also from Hong Kong uh, internationally. So, um, without further ado, I will invite uh, our first uh, speaker to the podium. Uh, the topic uh, she made, uh, Xie, she made slight change uh, on her topic. Uh, now is uh, the Republic of uh, Characters: Hong Kong Typefaces and Global Knowledge Making in the 19th Century. Please. Thanks, Dr. Lin Fan, for the kind introduction. And good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Yun Xie. Uh, I'm here to talk about a fascinating subject, Chinese metal movable type. And to spice things up a little bit, I have prepared some multiple choice questions for all of you <laughs> during my presentation. And feel free to raise your hand and take a guess. And don't worry, they are not meant to, uh, meant to trap you. There's just no pressure to match my answer exactly. So just uh, let's just have some fun and enjoy the journey together. So uh, in 2019, a remarkable discovery emerged. In the isolated warehouse of the Folkenkunde Museum, more than 9,000 pieces of the 19th century Chinese type matrix were unearthed. And the Chinese characters which were embedded in this matrix were originally designed in Hong Kong. It's why this font name is Hong Kong type. When we talk about the movable type, it's hardly to overlook the monument figure of Johannes Gutenberg. As uh, the pioneer of mobile type in Europe, Gutenberg's contribution to letter press printing is undeniable. While well, certain research proposed that he refined the existing uh, techniques rather than invented them outright, but here we shall not go deeply that debate. So instead, let's focus on the method that Gutenberg actually used. So his technique encompassed a three-phase process. First, make a punch. And second is inverting it to make a matrix. And then to cast the tab with the matrix. Then is my first question. According to Gutenberg, which step takes the longest time? Please feel free to raise your hand. A, punch cutting. Great. B, matrix making. Thank you. And C, type casting. Great. Thank you. And the answer is A, punch. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The first phase punch cutting is most time consuming as it demands exceptional ex expertise and considerable patience to engrave a very tiny character onto the surface of a hard metal bar. And punch cutting represents the foremost and pivotal phase in the type phase making. And typically, making one punch can cost a punch cutter one day's work. So therefore, we can deduce that if using Gutenberg's method, the number of the type phase must not be too large. So the majority of European scripts are based on alphabet. So typically, 
consisting of about 26 letters. Even with inclusion of the uppercase, the lowercase, and sometimes special symbols, the total count usually range between 60 to 70, and occasionally 100. But concerning Chinese characters, I would like to ask another question. Which number is closed to the number of characters for printing a Chinese book? So A, 500, B, 1,000, okay, thank you, C, 5,000, yes, I see <laughs> many hands, yes, the answer is C, 5,000. So, uh, but however, I have to make uh, it clear, it doesn't imply that 5,000 characters can fully meet the printing requirements, as each book may require different characters. But in general, 5,000 characters are sufficient. So for the European scripts, 60, 70. Chinese characters, 5,000. And don't forget, one punch cutter make one punch per day. So therefore, applying Gutenberg's method to the Chinese characters would be a mission impossible, as simple mathematics would lead us to, de to deduce. Here, we need to clarify another technical distinction. Although movable type printing existed in China also a long time ago, using materials such as clay, wood, and occasionally also metal, but the Chinese method of movable type printing is to carve, carve the each character individually, not casting. So a single book could require more than 10,000 of characters. Each one needs to be carved. Therefore, it's not difficult to understand that for a long time period, the prevalent printing method in China was carving an entire page on a wood block and then to print, not each character. And by the 19th century, when European Protestant missionaries arrived in China to spread the Christianity, they had to consider suitable printing method. Since missionary work was illegal at the time, they had to secretly print in their religion books. If using wood block, as we just showed, usually several hundreds pieces of wood block for one book, so which would take a considerable space and were difficult was, you know, was clearly unsuitable being taken away when government reads because illegal. So furthermore, due to the work was illegal, so it was difficult for missionaries to find the local printers willing to take the risk. So as a result, missionaries began to think about the Gutenberg method they were familiar with in Europe and which they could operate by themselves. However, they encountered a new problem. There was no typeface. Thus, the missionaries embarked on a task to creating the Chinese metal typeface by themselves. Due to the political environment in China, they relocated their printing facilities to South Asia regions. In India, Malaysia, Indonesia, missionaries from different churches attempt to produce Chinese typefaces. However, as Chinese typefaces were in completely new endeavor, they encountered many challenges. So to overcome these difficulties, the missionaries, they learned from one another and exchanged experience and knowledge. So additionally, other regions such as Nagasaki in Japan, Paris and Berlin in Europe, and professional type designers, sinologists, are also joined the trend of Chinese typeface making. So where, well, there were sometimes competitors, they, the Chinese typeface maker from all around the world surprisingly share their experience and knowledge generously through correspondence, visiting, even purchase each other's typefaces. 
I refer to this phenomenon as republic of characters. And Hong Kong type was one of the variations within this collective endeavor. And Hong Kong type originally from the efforts of Samuel Dyer, a 19th century British missionary at Anglo-Chinese College in Malacca, a British colony at the time. Dyer's contribution was cut short as he passed away in 1843, having completely, com having a complete slightly over 1,000 Chinese characters. And following the conclusion of First Opium War in 1840, Hong Kong transitioned into a British colony, which led to the relocation of the Anglo-Chinese College from Malacca to Hong Kong. In this new setting, other missionaries and their Chinese assistants continued the type design project. And by the 1850s, the total amount of typeface had expanded to 5,500. And in addition to use the type for themselves, the missionaries began to sell them to a wider audience. And among the clients of the Anglo-Chinese College, the Dutch government was one of them. The introduction of Hong Kong type into the Netherlands was closely interwoven with the Dutch expansion in, Europe, uh, in Asia during the 19th century. In the Dutch East Indie colonies, a considerable number of Chinese people living there and building up their own community. The Dutch, colony, the Dutch colonial authorities communicate with the leader of the Chinese people in Malay, the lingua franca of the time. Meanwhile, the Chinese community maintained their own custom and language to a significant extent. However, in the 19th century, the tensions arose between the Dutch colonial authority and the Chinese community. The Dutch authorities suddenly found out they did not have a reliable Chinese translator. This urgent need for Chinese translation led to the establishment of the Sinology Department at Leiden University. Furthermore, the Dutch who had enjoyed an inclusive trade advantage in Japan for over 200 years, faced the challenges from other European countries and America in the 19th century. S strengthening ties with Japan and learning Japanese language suddenly became a very high priority. Of course, there were also trade demands in China, but they were not that urgent at the moment. So it was mainly this the situation in Dutch East Indies and in Japan that prompted the Dutch to quickly learn Chinese and Japanese language and also the ability to print in Chinese. And the Dutch purchased 5,500 Hong Kong type from Anglo Chinese College in Hong Kong. However, since they need to compel the Dutch Japanese dictionary and Dutch Chinese dictionary to learn the language rather than a normal book. So 5,500 seems insufficient. The Dutch had to design more characters by themselves, creating additional 4,000 characters, bringing the total to 9,000. When the typeface were ready, the Dutch began to send them to printers for typesetting and printing. Here is a typesetting table for European types, as big as a desk, just like this. So a typesetter stands in front of the table and selects the types. But now it's 9,000 Chinese characters. Obvious one table would not be enough. So let's have a look at the typesetting table for Chinese type. Now, let's imagine you were a Dutch typesetter, completely unfamiliar with Chinese language. How would you go about selecting the characters from the entire room filled with Chinese typefaces? I provide you with three options, and feel free to raise your hand. So, which method <laughs> the Dutch typesetter will use for the Chinese typesetting? 
So start learning Chinese. Nobody, okay. <laughs> B, let the sinologists to do the job. Yeah, some. Okay, C, assign mu nu nu numerical codes to the character. Great. <laughs> so, answer is C. And during the 1850s and the 1860s, Professor Johann, Hof, uh, Johann Josef Hoffmann was the only professor at Leiden University with expertise in teaching Chinese. The efforts of Hoffmann was instrumental in re resolving this issue. And he also played a pivotal role in introdu uh, introducing the Hong Kong type to the Netherlands. And Hoffman drew, it, drew in inspiration from a traditional Chinese dictionary's retrieval method, known as the Bu Shou's stroke method. Most of Chinese characters have ra radical, so, and it's called Bu Shou. And when, which can be thought as the root of, or the basic component of a character. So based on this Bu Shou, the Chinese characters can be ca categorized into 214 groups here. And which, uh, within each group, characters are further organized based on the order of strokes. And Hoffman adopted this method and incorporated it into a new, uh, new numerical system. And each Chinese character is signed two numbers so one number for the bushel and another number for strokes. And by this way, Hoffman transformed this frightening task of select characters from entire room into a straightforward process. And we can imagine one side is the bushel, another side is the stroke. Then we can lo locate where the type is. So, but I have to point out, the Hoffman did not invent this whole system, but he cleverly put this system into a coding system, make it easily comprehensible at a glance. Synologist Eric Zucher recalled this working process of the master typesetter of Braille publishing. Moving between his typecases like a toyist priest, performing a dancing ritual and producing with incredible speed and accuracy, any character from a collection containing nearly 8,000 characters, and all this without knowing the meaning of any of them. <laughs> from, the, from the arrival of Hong Kong types in the, night, in the Netherlands in 1858 to, eight, to 1980s when they were re, uh, re replaced by the new technology. These funds made an incredible contribution to the field of sinology in the Netherlands. However, let us not forget the creation of this character was a collective effort. It was the result of the wisdom of missionaries, the contribution of the Chinese assistance and the exchange of knowledge among the missionaries, sinologists, printer, and all of others worldwide. So I refer to this interconnected network of wisdom as republic of characters. And for, for anyone who might be interested, the name of republic characters derived from the scholarly community known as Republic of Letters from 16th to 18th centuries. And this community was known by their cross-border connections and sharing of, sharing of knowledge. In the field of Chinese type making, this kind of network and knowledge passing continue to this day. And you may wonder, how were these typefaces discovered? Allow me to introduce Mr. Ronald Sestour, in, also in our audience, who played a crucial role in rediscovering the Hong Kong types. And during the break, during the break and feel free to approach him and ask questions. I believe he'll be very happy to share the remark, re remarkable account uh, of his rediscovery. Thank you all.
Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia. I'm a full-time research assistant at the Department of History from Hong Kong Baptist University. So I travel all the way from Hong Kong to talk to you. Not about Hong Kong. I think um, Ashley has given us like the best Hong Kong story that we can tell. So today I will be talking about um, an area that is very understudied and underrepresented in world history and in art history, which is Vietnam. And I will be talking about the Vietnamese experience at the Paris Colonial Exposition in 1931. And before I begin, my mom and dad is watching. So, hi mom, hi dad. <laughs> okay. So, the Colonial Exposition opened its door on May 6, 1931 in the Vincennes Forest on the outskirts of Paris. After the economic crisis in 1929, this was a long-awaited event that was um, intended to gauge the dwindling interest of the French public towards the French project of colonialism. And it was a success because during the six months that the exposition was opened, um, it was estimated that seven to nine million visitors from across the world had come to this World's Fair. Now, in front of a predominantly Dutch audience, I regret to tell you that the Dutch colonial pavilion in this um, same exhibition had caught fire and burned down. <laughs> okay, so we don't know who did that or why. Uh, I guess we will never know, but I digress. Now, um, the French public was not the only one who was incentivized by this event because from 1929 to when the exposition ended in December 1931, more than a dozen Vietnamese language newspaper and periodicals had run nearly 100 news items um, reporting on this exposition alone. So what do they talk about? There are advertisements from the colonial government for artisans and business people who would like to have their goods um, on display in this exposition. There are lists of personnel and local indigenous representatives. There are um, congratulatory messages and um, reports of the happening at Paris. So from the survey of the newspapers, I will tell you three stories of who are the Vietnamese at Paris. Okay. Now, these are dancers and singers and performers that have been brought from the colony of Indochina, more specifically from North, Central, and Southern Vietnam to perform at the exposition. Now, if you look at the left, this is actually from a newspaper in France in 1931. So the lady um, in, the, in, in the front is usually attributed to a diva called Miss Namphy, and she was praised by the French newspapers like La Comédia and Le Figaro as a very charming um, singer, song, like dancer, and she can rival any French opera diva. So the mise en valeur of the colonies are represented in such a way that um, they are always in characters and they're always doing, you know, what is supposed to be the ethnographic dance from the colonies. And um, the colony is brought to France to be consumed in all this packaging, like they step off the plane in their characters and they start performing. The second story is this handsome young man. So he is a local sporting talent uh, called Monsieur Jim, and he is actually a tennis champion. So um, he and his brothers uh, rose to fame when the French colonial government tried to encourage um, modern sportings like cycling and tennis in the colony. And they were so popular that they were like the butt of the joke in a satirical novel in the 1930s. So in this um, column, the newspaper is congratulating him on his journey to France because um, as a you know, local representative, he had uh, participated in many contests across um, the colonies. Uh, he had played with Burmese and uh, Malaysian, Singaporean, Indonesian representative. But this is the first time that he had been chosen to play tennis in France with people from civilized countries, meaning you know Western 
um, countries. And in this photograph, like he is seen wearing what um, they call a guk fok, or a national costume, but he's also wearing leather shoes. And he is posing for the camera, which is the apparatus of modernity that had came with the French and become increasingly popular in Vietnam. So on the topic of photography, this is my favorite, favorite item from the newspaper. So this is an, a recurring advertisement on two newspaper in March and April. It's bought by a, an owner of a photo studio in Saigon. And um, the title said, who wants to go see Paris? If you would like to join, um, please contact our photo studio. We are offering a package tour so that you can come to Paris and enjoy the festivities of the exposition. And after the exposition, they also had an advertisement to say that if you would like to have your photographs printed on our beautiful paper, please contact us. So this is a very good business model, right? So you, you take everyone to go to Paris, they take photos, and then they develop their photos in your studio. But look at that. Who wants to go see Paris? Now, it's not just the physical act of getting on a ship, on a boat, and then travel to Paris. What is there to see in Paris? The colonial exposition, right? So they are catering to a Vietnamese customer that is increasingly you know, curious. They want to go to see Paris. They want to go see themselves, um, see ourselves being represented. And they desire that colonial image of Vietnam as a country with 4,000 years of literary, cultural, history, tradition, and more than 70 years of French colonialism. Okay, now I wish that the story ends like that. But apparently, the Vietnamese newspaper, although they were very happily reporting on these um, events, they were also quite discontented because they were the only group of you know, middle-class um, stakeholders who were not financially sponsored by the Franco-Vietnamese government to go cover the Paris Exposition. And, um, you know, increasingly, although these people have a lot of stakes in you know, this business of um, colonial exposition, they were also very politically active and they were reform-minded as well. So, um, following the success of the 1931 expositions, there were talks in the French um, government about political reforms for the colony, especially for Vietnam. And many ideas were given out. So someone said that they should continue with you know, collaborative colonialism policy. Some said that they should do a protégé or protectorat um, policy. And a French militarist had proposed that they should use the assimilationist policy that was so successful in Africa that they turned you know, tribal men and women into respectable French men and women, or what Franz Fanon may call black skin, white mask. But in an editorial in December 19th, 1931, um, the Vietnamese journalist was not happy at all. So he was using this occasion to first respond to what was being said in the French government and also to push for their, um, you know, the Vietnamese middle class um, intention for reforms. So he was adamant that Vietnam was a culturally rich and militarily powerful nation long before the arrival of the French and that the French had promised to bring enlightenment and civilization to Vietnam. So now it is time for France to realize this promise. And how did they do that? They turned the colonizer's word against themselves. So recall Albert Sarrault. Albert Sarrault is the guy who's wearing spectacles in this image. He was the governor general of Indochina from 1912 to 1914 and 1917 to 1920. 19, and he was responsible for bringing Vietnamese emperors to the expositions in the motherland. So in 1931, he was asked to talk about French colonialism in French Indochina again. And the writer used his words to remind the French government of their promise to bring civilization and enlightenment to Vietnam. So what did Albert Sarrault said? So he said, and they translated, 
and I quote, our protection method is not to scare people, but it is the cooperation of the personalities and characteristics of the yellow race and the white race. One day, the yellow race will recognize that France is capable of outdoing everyone else on this globe and even ourselves. That will be the day they understand us, not as a teacher, since we do not wish to do so, but as guides, as close consultants, and they will know that we will be and we are worthy of remaining in Indochina. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all very much for attending. It is such a pleasure to be here. So I am a student art history at the University of Amsterdam, and I am currently writing my thesis on the depiction of women in the early, and early 20th century Japanese woodblock prints, focusing on the phenomenon of the so-called modern girl. Maybe naively and a little bit ambitiously, I took on the subject because my goal of this research is to learn about the history of collecting Japanese prints within the Netherlands, but also to think about embedding the female narrative and representing women within these collections, a very hot topic currently. An awareness that even though much research has been done, especially in female fe feminist academic world, yet the museum world has a lot of catching up to do. However, I'm a firm believer that museums should reflect our blind spots in order to develop, and I'm therefore very thankful to the, to the KVV AK for an opportunity to talk about my research on a wonderful collection which has recently entered the collection of the Rijksmuseum. The collection I am discussing today is a gift from collector Elise Wessels. This is, an, an, uh, this is an announcement made in October of last year. She has gifted, through the Fur Elise Foundation, a substantial part of her collection to the Rijksmuseum, compromising of more than 1,100 Japanese prints, magazines and more. The Nihon no Hanga collection is the most important collection of 20th century Japanese um, prints in the Netherlands. Thanks to this gifting, the Rijksmuseum will be able for the first time to offer a representative overview of Japanese works on paper from the 17th till the 20th century. The Rijksmuseum has marked the donation with an exhibition of 60 prints in the Asian Pavilion, which was held from October 2022 to April 2023. There we go. I would like to take a moment to remember Elisa as she passed away last week. An extraordinary woman with a passion for collecting and sharing the beauty of Japanese prints, which for me and many others was a huge inspiration. In the wake of her legacy, her prints will continue to be a remarkable addition to the collection, being incredibly important for both young and established researchers, such as the presenters here today. Now, by the advent of the 20th century, four decades of modernization had forever altered Japanese cultural landscape. Japan was rapidly evolving from an agrarian to an industrial society, with people leaving the countryside for modern cities such as Tokyo and Osaka at a fast rate. As Japan's improved international currency position enabled an increased number of people to travel to America and Europe, particularly after World War I, uh, many Western manners and customs, somewhat modified, were eagerly adopted by a wider society. By the mid-1920s, social change had a huge impact on women's lives. Mass migration to urban areas, educa education for women, and a whole new range of jobs for female workers meant that women left the traditional female sphere of the home and began to appear in the outside world in large numbers. 
the modern consumer society was a process by which the female body was gradually accepted into the urban public spaces. New occupations such as typists, bank clerks, bus conductors, waitresses and department store assistants increased the demand for women in the workforce. The stigma attached to a woman began to fade, although these changes were in reality very slow and women were highly discriminated against at work and in wages. For example, higher positions in the management remained out of reach and despite a growing awareness of how the position of women gradually developed in the West, the effects of an 1896 reaffirmation by the Japanese government that the position of women as being legally subservient to men was still to be felt. Writer Kitazawa Shuichi introduced the term modern girl, or modangaru, abbreviated to moga, to Japanese readers in the women's magazine Josai in 1924. The importance of magazines is in the birth of the modern girl is not to be underestimated. Mass magazines for women were not the only media uh, diffusing consumer culture, but they were one of the more affordable com commodities connected less privileged women to those in the middle class, and hence to the culture of consumerism. Within a year, the outward displays that were to characterize the modern girl in Japan had surfaced and crystallized. A typical modern girl was described with the following traits. Apolitical, autonomous, disobedient, uh, liberated from all age-old conventions, animated, flirtuous, militant, and westernized. Her behavior included her behavior included gimbura, or ginza cruising, referring to going out in the ginza and moving from bar to bar, dancing in dance halls, um, and ac actively pursuing men. She could be smoking and drinking, and perhaps most importantly, she was an active consumer, demonstrating her financial independence. And if you think of it, Modern girls appear to challenge proper female commitments to the nation, uh, be it as active participants in the nationalist struggle for liberation or refusing to be mothers, the biological reproducers of national subjects and populations. Japanese writers at the time de uh, debated the political implications of the modern girl. Virtually all agreed that that whatever the ramifications of her message, it was largely conveyed by her fashion and her body. Her appearance was aggressive and erotic, and she was immediately distinguished by her short hair and her contemporary clothes, which often left her legs visible. To a large degree, writers saw the moga as unrestricted because of Western clothing. It indicated new foreign attitudes. To give you a sense of how the modern girl was perceived, I will read a fragment from 1927 about the modern girl entering the public space. When you step into the Ginza, it really is modern. A beautiful, short-haired Missy skims her way through like a swallow, just before me, as I absent-mindedly shop for drawing materials. She walks fast, as if she were different to the girls of only a decade ago. She walks in a rush. Another group of three beauties comes from the opposite direction. There really are a lot of women out these days. In former times, one rarely met a lady when one went out. But today, there are many. None of them seem to have anything particular to do. Yet, they all rush by. And this piece gives a great deal of impression of how society is changing through the male gaze. We need to remember that most of the texts published and the prints made at the time were by men. Especially the last sentence, when the author is talking about how these women do not seem to have anything particular to do, even though they were participating in society as workers. Hence, the freedom to stay out of the household is quite remarkable. The female image has long been recognized as a principal subject in Japanese art. 
The poster, although more appropriately a picture signboard, was the new visual medium of the modern world. And this existence was closely related to the commercial market. In other words, many Japanese prints at the time were made with commercial purposes. In the visual arts, Nihonga in painting and Shinhanga in prints were largely born of a desire to maintain the traditions of the pre-modern past. By idealizing subjects reminding of Japan, Shinhanga both reflected and helped, helped to shape Japanese public opinion. The art of Japanese printmaking has a tradition of depicting women, especialized, especially idealized beauties such as the biin, as we can see here as the embodiment of Japanese virtues and traditions such as these. Therefore, the female image underwent widespread distribution. Given the generally conservative leaning of artists, publishers and patrons associated with the Shinhanga movement, it is not surprising that depictions of the modern girl were extremely few relative to the amount of prints of the traditional Beijing. However, the modern girl stood out the most and caused the most controversy and thus attracted the attention from printmakers. These prints by Kobayaka Kiyoshi are part of the series Women's Manners of Today and were shown in the exhibition in the Rijksmuseum. There are six prints in total. Uh, no other artist produced as many prints of the modern girl in early 1930s as Kiyoshi but his print oeuvre is quite small as he mainly made paintings. One of these prints is the most important depiction of the modern girl in print during the 20th century. I will give you a few seconds to guess which one it is. The print on the far left, which is, has the title Tipsy, is a quintessential modern girl in uh, Shinhanga. The woman depicted wears her hair in a bob cut, holding a cigarette with a Manhattan cocktail complete with cherry garnish. Placed against a red solid background, a color also seen in the glowy cherry, glowing cherry of her cigarette, her nails, her lips, the young woman stares suggestively and very directly to the viewer. And what is remarkable is that although these prints are obviously uh, versions of idealized women, they are also showcasing the difference between a more traditional beauty and a modern beauty. All in the same series. Furthermore, these series had to be privately published. This indicates that perhaps the subject matter, the modern girl, led the artist to be forced to do so due to, uh, due to the oppressive climate caused by the Japanese government around printmaking during that time. Another print which captures the essence of the modern girl is the new Carleton dancers in Shanghai. This print uh, is, by the way, was already uh, in the collection of the Rijksmuseum, so this is not part of the gift. Uh, the publication of this print in 1924 coincided with the first usage, usage of the modern girl uh, in the magazine Josai. In Coca's print, we see two women in a ballroom in the new Carleton Hotel in Shanghai, enjoying, again, Manhattan cocktails. So, it was a staple. If you were a modern girl, you had to drink Manhattan cocktails. They are watching ballroom dancers, dressed in Western clothing with short hair. Coca's print is now considered a significant example of modern girl imagery in Japanese woodblock prints not only ca for capturing the attitude and style of the girls, but for depicting the atmosphere and location to which these girls would go independently, without any male companion. One of the biggest contradictions that I found in the portrayal of women in these collections are the prints of the dancers by, again, Kiyoshi. Because if you think about it, the Japanese government tried to man mandate prints of Japanese traditional culture, such as the geisha in traditional dress, which would be printed and distributed. And well, this is of course the complete opposite of that. We see here two female dancers in Western dress, the one on the left bending backwards, while if you look closely, 
I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but her little toe of the right foot is just slipping out of the shoe. This again, an idolized version of women produced for the commercial market. What we see here are types of entertainers who would be performing on, on the stage of dance halls. What is not surprising is that the dance halls attracted the attention of the Japanese government, especially in the course of the 1930s. The authorities took many measurements to curtail behavior in dance halls and cafes, such as the prohibi prohibition of the, I quote, wiggling of the behind. My hope today is that I very briefly could showcase to you the incredibly uniqueness of the modern girl in the early 1920th century Japanese prints. However, conducting my research on these prints made me realize that we are looking at a very specific way that these women were portrayed. She is defined in her role as consumer or associated with places of pleasure, such as cafes and dance halls. It is my wish as an art historian that through research, we can define the other side of the modern girl as a worker in Japanese society, but most of all, as a type of female who took her form in Japanese society as someone who exhibited a newly found independence and marked, and marked the unprecedented public visibility of young women in the early 20th century. I would like to end my presentation with these words from scholar Miriam Silverberg on her research on the modern girl. To deny life embodiment of the modern girl is to ignore the actual young women who were modern. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Mingle Lu from the University of Groningen, and my research topic is about the Dutch exhibition of contemporary Chinese art. Due to the limitation of time, I could only introduce one of my case studies here. It is the China Avant-Garde exhibition in 1993 in Rotterdam, which is the earliest Dutch exhibition of contemporary Chinese art. I have listed some of the details here for your reference. I believe many of you have heard of or seen the exhibition of some Chinese artists, such as Ai Weiwei, in Dutch museums. Maybe you just take it for granted, because in 2023, it is a common thing for Dutch people to see contemporary Chinese artwork in Dutch museums. But if we go back to the 1990s, just imagine when the Cold War just ended, when the transnational communication was not as convenient as today, and when Chinese government still have strict censorship and culture, how could a museum in the Netherlands know such artists in China? And how could they display their works in their exhibition hall? Well, so that's my question. So unlike the existing literature which focused on the objects and artists, my focus is behind the scene. I want to know how the network of agents interact with each other and how these artworks from China were introduced into Netherlands and who made the decision. I mean, what kind of Chinese artwork could be introduced into Netherlands and why? So I try to analyze this exhibition based on the art sociological discourse, especially the actor network theory, and here is a brief map about how it works. From this, at the center, you could see there is a specific of people who served as a bridge between the Dutch art circles and the Chinese one. It, they could be described as cultural brokers in the art sociological discourse, which refer to a group of people who transferred, translate a cultural product from one community to another. And there are Hans van Dyck, a Dutch artist, Johann Oss, a German art lover, and Andrea Schmidt, a German artist. How could they become the cultural brokers for contemporary Chinese art in the Netherlands? Well, in the 1980s, Chinese government has released a series of new policy that allow foreign students to study in Chinese university, which is amazing at that time. 
So Hans van Dyck and Andrew Schmidt got the chance to study in Chinese art academies in 1980s. And Jochen North just worked for Chinese companies and institutions in Beijing at that time. During their stay in China, they established good relationships with Chinese artists, Chinese art critics, and they just witnessed the ongoing art movement that happened in China. However, after the Tiananmen Square in 1989, most foreigners in China were forced to go back to their homeland. When these three figures returned to Europe, they believed they had the responsibility to help their artist friends in China who were under the strict censorship from the central government. And they also want to display what they saw in China to their local audience. As a result, they wrote the exhibition proposals and sent them to the local institutions and art museums. And they tried to get connections with some leading figures from these institutions. With their effort, a transnational networking of agents in the distribution of contemporary Chinese art was constructed in the 1990s. With this framework or system, the artworks of contemporary Chinese artists could be introduced and be transported into the Netherlands and be displayed in the, China, in the Dutch museums. So the next question is, how decisions are making? How did these people decide what kind of artworks should be introduced into the Netherlands? Here is another map about the structure of the curatorial board of this exhibition. As you can see, Jochen North, Hans van Dijk, and Andrea Schmid served as the curators of this exhibition. They took charge of the selection of artists, the exhibition design, the writing of exhibition catalogs, and even the transportation of artworks from China to Netherlands in secret because it was forbidden by the Chinese government at that time. So they must rely on their personal relationships. But the director of the museum still holds the power to make the final decision. And actually, I have to say, though all members in this map want to launch an exhibition about contemporary Chinese art, each of them have their own interests and motivations. For example, York North, he's not an artist, and he wants to exhibit what Beijing is as a city. Hans van Dijk wants to have some very academic survey about the experimental fine art in China as many as possible. And Andrew Schmidt wants to focus on specific art groups or artists. And the museum itself wants to launch an extensive cultural project, include not only the fine art, but also music, film, theaters, operas, and something like that. So you must negotiate. And there is also disagreement between the curators and the museum. It's about the theme of the exhibition. These curators want to have an exhibition named as modern Chinese art, but the museum prefers the term China avant-garde. Actually, modern, museum, modern Chinese art is a term used by Chinese artists and Chinese art critics themselves to describe their art productions. But the museum believe avant-garde is a term that the European audience are familiar with, so it will make it easier for them to launch some marketing campaigns and to make money in the local art circles. So there are the difference. It, it could be approved by the different version of the exhibition proposals, as you can see here. The original version is about modern Chinese art. And the final version is China avant-garde. We could say, OK, the curators just to make concession to the museums and need to follow the institutional philosophy of the museums. And though the final version is still focused on the experimental fan art in China, there are some additional programs about, such as the lectures about literature and some music event were added to this project. So, it's just a negotiation, a result of negotiation. And it is this collective construction that shaped what we know as contemporary Chinese art in the Netherlands today. 
And we could say how this interpretation was received by the Dutch art circle. This exhibition was quite successful and it attracted some Dutch art dealers and some Dutch art collectors to see them. Many of them got interested in the Chinese art and they started to represent their artworks in their own art galleries, for example, the one in the Amsterdam. And they started to collect Chinese artworks. And they also helped the participating artists of the exhibition in 1993 to hold further solo exhibitions or group exhibitions in the Netherlands, which just significantly promote their career in the Dutch art circle. And as you can see, with this kind of exhibitions, the transnational networking between China and Netherlands in the art distribution were largely expanded. More and more agents are involved in this circle and more and more exhibitions were actualized. So if just today or tomorrow you entered a museum and you say, okay, it's the exhibition of contemporary Chinese art, you may know, wow, everything could be traced back to the exhibition in 1993. And all these interpretations, all the receptions of the today's museum could be influenced by them. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talks, uh, fascinating topics. Uh, it covers a much broader uh, geographical area and also a lot of uh, themes. So now maybe I will invite uh, all the presenters uh, to the front. Uh, we, uh, now the floor is open for uh, questions. And could you please uh, turn on the lights? Uh, we can see the audience. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> please. Okay, uh, so uh, questions and uh, comments, yeah, please. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that every presentation was very, very interesting. Uh, and I have a question for Celine. Um, I was wondering, because you talked about the modern girl and the depictions of the modern girl in Japan, I was wondering if there was maybe a response from the modern girls as to how they were depicted. Um, yeah. Oh, I think uh, her mic is muted. Yeah? yeah? Oh, okay. great. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, well, what I first of all noticed, I'm still doing my bachelor thesis and um, I'm not able to read Japanese texts yet. So that was for me personally quite a big gap in my research is that I wasn't able to read all the Japanese response to the, um, to the phenomenon and the way people wrote about it at, during that time. So I personally had to mostly rely on Western text based on uh, Japanese texts. Um, but the difficult thing about the response of the modern girl is that there is not a lot because most texts were written by men and the modern girl was as well, uh, as well that there were actually modern girls of course being there it was also um, taken by the media and sort of used as a way to promote uh, the consumer society. But it was based on a, a real person indeed. Um, so that will be a case for further research if there's actually a lot of written text. And that will be very interesting because I think it would be important that we could actually name the individuals who are participating in uh, that first feminist wave in the, in the 20s. Of course, there was before that. But during that time, who were, the, uh, who were the women who were participating and actually making sure that um, the modern girl could be who she was? Yeah. yeah thank you. OK, I have a question from the, from the chat, from Julie Hong for Alicia, do you also know of Vietnamese objects that were sent to France to be exhibited at the Exposition Colonial in 1931? If yes, which kind of objects did they choose to represent France Indochina? 
specifically Vietnam. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, it's, very, it's a very simple question. Um, we have looked at this painting for many days, right? And it's um, painted by a Vietnamese painter called Mai Chung Thu. So Mai Chung Thu was, um, he attended the um, Indo-Chinese School of Fine Arts um, from 1925 to 1930s. And this was the cohort that produced many painters um, that later on became very famous and were considered um, you know, the Vietnamese painters, or what we think of as Vietnamese fine arts. Um, Nora Taylor has done a very extensive um, research of this. So what I want to say is they graduated in 1930, and the exposition was in 1931. So their paintings were brought to be displayed in the Indo-Chinese pavilion in Paris to showcase the success of the Indo-Chinese schools of fine arts um, and the French project of, you know, like um, teaching the Vietnamese, the, um, the Cambodians, the Laotian, on how to, you know, paint in the European and the French style. And actually, um, I showed a photo um, of, you know, the Vietnamese dancers coming to Paris in an um, airplane. So they, from, it is from the um, pictorial from France. It's called Illustration. So actually, Illustration has a very special um, edition in 1931 that is all about the Indo-Chinese painters and the paintings that is on display um, at the uh, Indo-Chinese pavilion. And um, actually, if you look at um, what is um, the research that has been done for Vietnamese um, fine art and art history, um, these are the group of people that is, you know, kind of overstudied by now. So I didn't choose to talk about it, although I did recognize this painting, and that is why I applied to to talk at this conference about Vietnam. <laughs> yes, but there, there are other things that had been brought to Paris, and they were housed at I think it's called like the Museum of the Colonies, and then I think it was like um, I think it's still now in Paris actually. So there were many. Um, objects and during my survey, you know, I, when I look at the newspaper, I did see a lot of things that were being um, recruited or being collected to bring to Paris. For example, um, they talk about like um, things that is um, that is simple, that is delicate, that is a very technological precise, but can. Um, represent the beauty and the simplicity of Vietnamese art. So things like, you know, vessels or uh, bowls, plates, um, even like toys, um, statues, Buddhist statues, Taoist statues. Um, you know, they, they even brought the whole Angkor Wat there, right? So there were many, many things, even, you know, like household objects that had been brought to Paris to build the pavilion. And um, there was a, a plan in 1929, um, and then they planned that um, there would be like one third of a pavilion that is used for like objects, one third for you know local artworks, and the remaining one third will be for the paintings produced by the Indo-Chinese painters. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, questions? I. Uh, yeah, because I want to follow up uh, also the Alicia's presentations on their uh, the presentations like the exhibition of Vietnamese in Paris. Mm -hmm. I actually wonder about like their story afterwards. They were presented mm -hmm. like all exhibits in Paris. How about the reaction of Vietnamese? Mm -hmm. Were they like ashamed of this, or would they feel super on to be? can be presented mm -hmm. as part of the, like the French yeah. empire at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you for your question. So um, as I had shown, this is the experience of a burgeoning Vietnamese middle class and upper middle class people. So they are the ones who stand to benefit from French colonialism in the colony. So they were like, educated in the new system in Indochina, and then perhaps they have gone to France for further studies. 
they come back, they have stakes in, you know, like business, in industries, in the colonial government. So, of course, they would be very invested and they would be very proud um, to see Vietnam represented, you know, all of this, like, traditional images. But then there's also, you know, like, tennis players and opera singers and, you know, new technologies being um, exhibited. And actually, um, the Vietnamese language newspaper were very proud of it. And um, uh, we saw the dancers from Cochin China, right? So after they had come back from Paris, they did a tour um, to Hanoi. And it was called like Tongkang back in the day. So they, they reenacted what they had performed in Paris for Vietnamese audience to, to watch. And then they have also like transported some of the objects back to, um, to northern Vietnam in Hanoi and in Nam Dinh. And they um, advertise it for the Vietnamese public to say that if you had not come to Paris to look at these exhibition objects, then now you can actually go to this you know, um, smaller exposition in Nam Dinh and in Hanoi to look at it. So that is the response of the middle class. But there is another like, very well-documented response from the, the students, the Vietnamese students in Paris, and um, some of them later on became revolutionaries um, in the, you know, the Vietnam War. So, you know, Ho Chi Minh and other revolutionaries were also presented at this, um, at this time. And they were, they were very good friends with the surrealist um, painters and artists in Paris. And the surrealists were a group of, uh, you know, very radical, rebellious, left-wing activists. And they actually organized uh, a response to the exhibition. It's called Ne Pas Visiter, uh, La Exposition. And then they um, put up a lot of, like, you know, objects from the colonies that, is, um, that belong to, you know, like, um, workers, farmers, the enslaved people, you know, the people from the lower classes. And they say that this is actually the truth, like this is the face of French colonialism in Africa and in Asia, and that you should be aware that um, what they are doing now is, is, you know, is whitewashing this project of colonialism. So it's actually very well documented as well. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Puspita. Uh, I'm a lecturer and researcher in Breda University. I have two questions for Hatu Onle, is uh, Alicia, and also Ms. Yunxie. So first uh, question, since I'm coordinating UNESCO Silk Road Textile Heritage on Southeast Asia, I would like to, um, I'm interested in seeing the silk and uh, what is the difference be of uh, bao dai and ao dai? And that will be nice to uh, see from your perspective. And from Ms. Yunxie, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I did my Chinese studies before in University of Indonesia. So there is a differentiation between typefaces from fan ti zi to jian ti zi, right? It's fan ti zi is the, the one that you show. It's a very um, ancient one. Um, we, we call it like the traditional Chinese. Uh, and then how is it in your perspective to move to jian ti zi, which is the simplified Chinese? Is there any, um, yeah, um, invention to uh, to to create this type setting? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm not uh, quite sure to understand your question, but if I'm wrong, please correct me. You said you ask from between the simplified Chinese jian ti zi to fan ti zi, right? So actually, this transition uh, take place around the uh, 19 after. Uh, 1950s, after the PRC was uh, set, set up. So uh, the typeface I showed up of the fan ti was happened in the 19th century. So they were only used fan ti zi, the traditional. So uh, there was a, a saying said this the jian ti zi was another political movement by this PRC government. They want to create kind of a new language, also new national identity. There's one of them. But another, yeah, some people saying this is jian ti zi was not pretty, it was ugly, it was broken, the, break the old beauty of a language. But this point, I don't agree with that, but this belong to another, another discussion. So, uh, uh, please, uh, my answer. Uh, my answer is answer your question or not? Do you want to know more? Oh, 
Oh, yeah, great. So that point. So, uh, uh, yeah, the busho, uh, although from fan ti zi to jian ti zi, the words become to sim simplify, but the busho not. Busho not. Even suppose the busho, there is a, a traditional busho, but they change the traditional form to a simplified form, but still keep 214. So the framework is the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you mind repeating the question? Because I didn't get the last part. Um, Um, okay, so I am not a textile expert, but I can offer some perspective on the Alzai. Okay, so the Alzai is actually, um, we now may think of it as tradition, but as Eric Hoswan said, you know, tradition is actually invented. So, um, so also on this topic of Indo-Chinese painter, the Alzai was actually invented by the Indo-Chinese painters, namely two people. One is the painter Le Fo, and the other person is um, also a painter and fashion designer called Gatung, or in French, Le Mur. So, um, so the Alzai actually was adapted from some traditional, like old school, um, 18th, 19th century um, clothing that was worn by Vietnamese men and women. And um, it was, you know, kind of similar to, but not similar to the Chinese uh, wear. And they were also um, kind of dictated by what was um, being allowed by the monarchy at the time, because different um, empires, uh, sorry, different dynasties, like the emperor would have different, um, different ideas of what the normal people can wear and cannot wear. Um, but in general, um, when the Indo-Chinese painters um, received this education, um, it was in the 1920s and 1930s. So along with French colonialism, there was a movement to think about um, clothing, what to wear, like do you wear traditional Vietnamese clothing, do you wear Western suits, or can we adapt the Vietnamese traditional clothing into a newer and more you know, fashionable um, style of, of clothing that you can wear on an everyday basis but also retain some certain style of the, the old clothing. So, um, so, you know, like they had a lot of mock-ups, um, they have a lot of designs, and they also like gradually change a lot of the designs to fit with, you know, the Vietnamese women body type, you know, what is the, the length of a sleeve, the width of the pants. Um, there were a lot of things to be taken into consideration of, um, and then, Later on, it got um, adapted, and then it was broadcasted also through means of you know periodicals, um, uh, newspapers, booklets that instruct the Vietnamese women that this is you know the um, this is the new clothing for Vietnamese women. You know, it's also kind of like modern girl. Like this is what the modern Vietnamese girl should be wearing. Uh, this is how she should dress, how she should uh, conduct herself. And it was quickly adapted by the middle class women. And then, you know, after the, the titles of um, history, then now we come to think of it as tradition. But actually, at the time when it was invented, it was actually considered a very new and you know, innovative way of dressing and expressing um, colonial modernity. Yeah. yeah. Well, waiting for the mic, um yeah, the, the mic to be passed around. I have a question for Ming Liu, and then we will figure out who will be the next. Yeah, so um, I have a quick question uh, about uh, your uh, your presentation. So uh, I, will, I was really curious about uh, how the exhibitions uh, were uh, received uh, in the Netherlands among the general public. Yeah, so what about avant-garde? Does it uh, raise a lot of uh, attention? Yeah. Uh, based on the existing document, there are about 23 newspapers report on this exhibition, and six of them are about Feng Lijun and his political pop art, and another one, I mean, most of them are about the political issues, and the ideological identity about Chinese art, which is maybe more focused by the Dutch people at that time. I think it may 
the avant-garde is can be quite controversial concept, especially when we talk about the Chinese art, because, well, Chinese art critics have wrote several pieces to defend that Chinese avant-garde is avant-garde, but if we compared it with the European avant-garde, we could see slight differences. Yeah. yeah, and actually the curator Hans van Dijk himself mm. was not a very fan of the avant-garde mm. because he said this kind of description will discuss, will regard the Chinese contemporary artist as the political descendant mm. to some extent, which he do not want to do. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, the public media still focus on these political issues. It, yeah instead of the ecstatic values of these artworks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, sorry, I jumped the line. <laughs> yeah, please, uh, Hutz, yeah. Actually, my question follows that quite nicely because mm. I wanted to ask you whether uh, the fact that they had these exhibitions in, in Europe, in Netherlands and these other places, did that have an impact on, were people aware of that in China? Did it change their status? Did they receive some accolade for that? Can you say anything about that? I mean, the influence of this exhibition in China. The fact that they had the shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and actually, it really helped the develop development of Chinese contemporary art, especially the career of many Chinese artists, because Hans van Dyck. Uh, I, when I try to research this guy, I just astonished by mm -hmm. the fact there are not so many articles or studies about him, but himself is a very important figure in the field of contemporary Chinese art because basically his job is to help Chinese artists to know the latest trend from the West and to introduce him to its the key figures in the Europe and to promote their works in the Europe. And Many Chinese artists just call him Han Dai Ke, Fan Dai Ke, yeah, yeah, and Chinese name. And well, I have to say, with this work, uh, with these exhibitions, many Chinese artists could get access to go abroad, to visit Europe by themselves, and to get their artworks displayed in the. Europe, European art galleries, which was amazing because at that time, due to the government censorship, the Chinese artists, especially the official artists, could not exhibit or sell their works publicly in China. So the only way for them is to rely on the international audience to buy their works to make their living and to get the public recognition. And this exhibition really helped them in this process. Uh, following up on that, <laughs> I was also curious if, if you, so you said that the Dutch newspapers were really more focusing on the political aspect, but did you see any difference in how the exhibition was received in other European countries where they were displayed? And I'm also wondering if there were any responses from the visitors, like was it sold out? Were there many visitors? Did visit, you know, non-newspaper critics, uh, how they received the exhibition? And if there's time, I would also have a question for Inche, but maybe there's no more time. Oh, you maybe uh, uh, Ming Liu an answer your yeah, question okay. first. Yeah. I mean, about the other countries. Well, actually, I could not find so many documents about the these exhibitions in other countries because it traveled across uh, Germany, UK, and I remember Switzerland and Netherlands. So the language barrier is a difficult, major difficulty for me to read the local document, and I could not get access to the local archives by myself now. Maybe I will track it later, but as far as I know, uh, Fang Lijun and his work was still one of the most popular topic by mm -hmm. their local audience. Mm -hmm. And he was also regarded as the leading figure of the contemporary Chinese art at that time with these exhibitions and following exhibitions. And I think his 
regarded as the leading figure of what we call political pop. And if you see a guy with bald head and awkward smile, that is his work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I squeeze okay. in yeah, my sorry. question for Inxie? I was wondering if you could say something about the, the status of these matrices in Hong Kong. So why would they be willing to sell them off? Uh, because maybe because they already had enough that, that, that you would, they're, you know, very useful. Uh, so why they would allow them to leave Hong Kong or are there still m matrices like these left in Hong Kong today? Oh yeah, good question. So uh, I just uh, explained during my presentation there are three steps, punch, matrix, and taps. So for punch is most valuable asset to any uh, punch cutters. So if you have to the punch, then you can always re reproduce the matrix. And actually, there is a good point is the Dutch government, uh, Hoffman and Professor Hoffman, they did not uh, by the matrix. The, actually, the matrix here we have seen is produced in Amsterdam. There was a te technique we called uh, 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 the, sorry, the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. So the, the uh, sorry, <laughs> please, please. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Electrotyping, Electro sorry, the words in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So, electrotyping. So, that is a technique invented in 1845 around. So, be before the time, so punch cutters, they have to catch the punch, each, each uh, punch they have to cut by themselves, so one punch per day. But after that, they can, and this electrotyping technique, they uh, develop and uh, s spread whole world, whole world. And then when the Dutch people, they heard there is a Hong Kong type for sale, they, Dutch people, sorry, I use a Dutch word, crint. So is, uh, uh, they only think about if we buy the type, buy the type will be much cheaper than they buy the ma matrix. <laughs> <laughs> so they already think about if by the type and they produce the matrix in Amsterdam will be much cheaper. And because at the moment, as I see, the whole world except Hong Kong, there are many places they also sell types. But they also they think about first they think about the price. A second, they're in Paris, in Paris, in Berlin, they also sell Chinese types. They also consider to buy them, but they think about a co copyright problem. If they buy the type from pa Paris and brought the type to Amsterdam to, pr pr to produce the matrix, the Paris types, uh, type maker will be very angry. Perhaps it will involve lawsuit. So they think you will buy Hong buy from Hong Kong, far away from another world. So no, nobody know that. <laughs> <Okay>. Nobody <laughs> know that. So it's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just only buy the types and produce in some sense the matrix. So the matrix, I repeat, the matrix, they produce in Amsterdam. The type itself is produced in Hong Kong, but the original Hong Kong type already gone. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, I don't see other hands. So I uh, since we are in the panel of uh, exhibitions, so I'm, uh, I have a question for uh, each of you. So it, uh, because uh, I think at some point, uh, the, uh, the collections that you, you have been working on have uh, had been exhibited, right? So uh, all the topic, all the uh, collections that you are working on are historical from the 19th century to uh, Hong Kong and then to 1920s Japan, 30s Vietnam and uh, 1980s and 90s uh, China. So imagine uh, you're going, uh, if you are asked to uh, put together an exhibition about this, so what is the most important message that you want to communicate with the audience? So uh, what are the most interesting uh, complexities of your, uh, your collection, the collection that you have been working on. Um, uh, for me, okay. Yeah, I will start. <laughs> Please. So, uh, for me, but the most important thing for me is I'm thinking is one material is one material. We already see many materials, but 
what material can tell us the one point of no, no, the no knowledge? But mm -hmm. I think more important is the chemical bonds between the mm -hmm. uh, materials mm -hmm. and different bonds, and then you make a different store, different uh, account, mm -hmm. different uh, store story. Mm -hmm. Then suppose you look like the type or the, any fig figure. Suppose Johann Hofmann, I just showed us his portrait. If you only look the portrait, you only you only think about he has any connection with his Hong Kong type. Mm -hmm. And also in the Asian pavilions, sorry, I have. Very short time. In <laughs> Asian Pavilion, now it's showing a portrait of a Chinese figure. His name is Guo Chengzhang. But in this exhibition, also doesn't see anything about his connection with this Hong Kong type. Actually, this portrait, Guo Chengzhang, Guo Chengzhang's person, he was exactly the Chinese teacher of Johan Ho, 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 Ho Oh, okay. <laughs> so only with Guo yeah. Chengzhang, then the Hong Kong type finally can happen here. Yeah. Three yeah. Thank you, um, Ming Liu. Yeah, please. Uh, for me, um, in this exhibition, what I focused on is about the identity, the other, mm -hmm. and the otherness when we deal with Chinese contemporary art and other, and other words from Asia mm -hmm. and maybe Africa, maybe Latin America. Should we treat them as the other? I mean, mm -hmm. this kind of artwork, are uh, attractive for European people because of aesthetic value or the political value or some just some otherness that differentiates them between from other art genres. For example, the Asian pavilion. Yeah. I mean, should this kind of statues be displayed together with other statues from European artists mm -hmm. or should we separated from them and have their own exhibition hall, which is better for the future in the exhibition of this kind of yeah. artwork from the third world. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of discussion. We can have a lot of more discussion about what is world art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alicia, please. Um, I think for me, the most important question is um, representation. Mm -hmm. um, because when I, um, I did my undergrad at the University of Hong Kong, and my first degree was actually about Hong Kong studies. But when I graduated, I realized I didn't know anything about where I came from. So I started looking into Vietnamese history. And I realized that Vietnamese history and Vietnamese art history is often overlooked and understudied um, in the world, you know, across the world. And usually, um, and this is a historical fact, that Vietnamese studies um, was to serve a political agenda, which, you know, like was for the um, America um, Cold War motif. Mm -hmm. and, and after that, like, um, and because of the war and because of many things, Vietnamese history and Vietnamese Asian art um, you know, like place in Asian art in the world is often very political. Like, it's not for the sake of Vietnam or the sake of the culture, uh, but it's always to push a kind of agenda, whether you are, you know, like backed by the government anywhere, right? Or if you have your own political agenda. So it's often very very convoluted, it's very complicated. And even my mom, like before I came here, my mom was like, I don't think, um, you know, like your personality is fit for historical research because it's very political, <laughs> but you know, because you like it, so I let you try it. Yeah. And, and I think actually no, because I would love to see other Vietnamese scholars in this type of events, because yes, every yes. time you have these kind of events, you have a lot of Japanese, Korean, Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. even India and um, other places in Southeast Asia. But yeah. very often than not, you don't see a Vietnamese. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. that person is me now, so yeah. you have yeah. to put up with me. But I guess, um, I guess the, the, the representation is very important. Like, I think when we are outside of our home place, um, yeah. we would want yeah. to go to see an exhibition and to see what kind of objects does that exhibition or that museum have of us? What does that tell you about how the place sees us? What is, uh, why, why do they collect that, that object from us? What story do they tell for us? Yeah. And then what stories can we tell for ourselves? And you know, in that progress, we talk about good things, we got talk about bad things. These Vietnamese people I talked about, they are colonial apologists. Mm -hmm. But in that time, you know, they, they think of themselves as you know, Asian of change yeah. or like this 
um, they, they want to tell the, the Vietnamese stories um, mm -hmm. in the World's Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're happy that we chose this poster. Yeah. <laughs> Celine, please. Yeah. What is most difficult about uh, the collection of Elise Vessels and then specifically the modern girl is that mm -hmm. her identity is extremely fluid. Mm -hmm. So um, she was introduced in a magazine and she was taken by the media and mm -hmm. used for mass consumerism. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very unclear if you look at 1100 prints, which one depicts the MOGA and the three prints that I showed you earlier you can see that there's a type of women who are, both have um, characteristics which you can uh, take from the MOGA, but also more traditional. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of discussion about mm -hmm. what type of prints can we uh, take for the MOGA yeah. and yeah. which one we cannot. Um, yeah. And it, it's still up to debate because um, the schooler started in the 90s with research about the modern mm -hmm. girl. And then in 2008, there was a research group called uh, the Modern Girl Around the World Research Group. And they looked at all the countries. So for example, in France, the Garçon, and mm -hmm. in America, the Flapper. And it's just very difficult per country, for each country to look at the characteristics of uh, these girls. Yeah. So yeah. I would definitely say that f finding out the right characteristics in all these prints Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to tell when you can put a label on it, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 every uh, exhibition is a new narrative, right? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think we, uh, we don't have uh, time for more questions. So uh, th uh, let's, uh, let's uh, give a applause to uh, our <laughs> panelists. Um, so this is uh, the second panel, and please come back at uh, 4 p.m. Yeah, so we will have a 15 minutes break. Thank you.